So I get to introduce our speaker today, and I am really honored to introduce our speaker today because in the 15 years that I've been here, I do not remember ever doing this any other time, where we had the same quote-unquote guest speaker come and speak two weeks in a row. And the reason why we're doing that is because this is part of this paradigm shift that we're making to the body genuinely being the body. In other words, everybody has gifts, everybody has talents. You're supposed to be bringing them. Justine's sermon from last week, which was phenomenal, was about getting a word and bringing it. I hope you've done that. I'm sure she's going to say something about that as we get going. But the bottom line is, is that what we're doing in this church is we really wanted to kind of see what would happen. I mean, it's, can I just tell you, you know, it's really hard to write one sermon. You know, if you're not in, in the mode of it and doing it all the time and don't have, you know, if you have life other than just being paid to be at church and so on, it's hard to find that much time. And we just kind of wanted to see how hard was it to get two in a row and all that kind of stuff. So you were our guinea pig. And, you know, what better guinea pig than Justine, who's such a great preacher and has done so, many, so much teaching to begin with anyway. But, but the bottom line is, is I just, I have to tell you, um, this idea that God would disciple his church through everybody actually using their gift. This is not a new idea. It's just one that we've lost. And the way that this body is embracing, the comments that I got from Justine's sermon last week, the comments that I get from when people from the congregation are coming up and preaching, the kinds of things that are happening here with the youth steering team, the worship steering team, all of these various things that are being handled, the way that they're being handled, which is really remarkable. I just can't even begin to tell you what a sea change that is. Again, this isn't anything new. This is how the church started. It's just that it's not how it's been run for a very long time. And so I just think God's presence is with us. I think his anointing is here. I think his favor is here to show us what to do and how to do it and the whole nine yards. And so with that sort of vision cast, you already know Justine, would you just give her a big, warm welcome? Good morning. What brought you to uh, the temple today? What led you in? <laughs> oh, man, disappointment awaits you. Um, <laughs> now, how was your week? Who was here last week or heard the sermon, streamed it or something? How did your week go? How was this? Did you try it on? Wow. Wow. Something happened back there. That's amazing. I've been hearing amazing stories. Um, I mean, here's the thing. God is speaking, right? And um, he gave us ears and we can hear him. So I want to uh, encourage you to keep doing uh, what we talked about last week. If you weren't here, feel free to listen. Um, it's me, sorry. But it's God too, so that's good. <laughs> um, but if, you know, I just, um, I had a couple people ask me, that's great. I'm so excited about Simeon, but how do I hear God? I don't actually know how to do that. Um, and somebody else asked me, um, how do I know uh, when I speak it if it is God? Uh, it, well, the scriptures um, actually give us some real good encouragement and practical advice on how to measure and weigh and know, and right? And that's why we're in this series. So keep leaning and looking, and in the weeks and months ahead, we're going to be del uh, delving into more the practicalities of the outworking of the Holy Spirit. Does that sound good? It's really hard to, like, um, do everything in, like, 40 minutes, so that's why we come back week after week, right? And we're just going to keep adding, adding, adding to our knowledge of the Lord. Does that sound good? Yeah. So keep leading and looking. Um, and I would love to hear how it's going. I'm, I'm a bit of a cheerleader, so I could even use pom-poms if you need. But here's the thing. Last week we asked, what would it look like if we were a church or if God's church worldwide was a place where people could come and get an individual word from the Lord every week. That's what we're working towards, right? So keep going after it. I was hoping somebody would walk up to me this Sunday and have a word. Anyone were you supposed to? 
Really? No one prayed for me this week? <laughs> All right. Well, we are diving in um, to Luke 2 even more today. Last week, we um, had an acting troupe up here. Do you remember? Yeah. And right at the end, we had this random person. Did you notice? She got to about here and kind of just stopped. Do you remember? Amy, come stand here. Come on. And we got to the end of the story of Simeon. And um, in Luke 2, so grab your Bibles. We're in Luke 2. I'm a fan of paper Bibles. Here's why. You see where things are relative to other things. On a screen, which I love technology. I have a Bible on my phone too. But um, have you ever been in your Bible and gone, oh, that's where that verse is? Amidst all those other verses? Oh, that makes more sense now. Right, so getting your context is really great. So this is where we ended last week. Anna. So we're in Luke 2, and um, Simeon was led by the Spirit into the temple. Joseph and Mary had brought Jesus. He was um, six weeks-ish old. And, um, and Simeon prophesied with power. Just a guy, empowered by the Spirit, prophesied with power. And there was this um, stalker creeper on the side, <laughs> just like watching. And that's our Anna. And today, I'm so excited to talk about our Anna. Did I not do that, guys? You put it up for me. Take it away. There we go. Thanks, you can sit down. But remember how she looks right there, just standing there. St stalker creeper Anna. <laughs> I want to ask you, um, just in like super serious honesty, just for a sec. Um, what percent of your walk with the Lord is um, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, <laughs> choosing to do it, not because you feel like it? And what part of your walk with the Lord is, oh my gosh, I love God, <laughs> emotion, excitement. Do you sit here more or sit here more? Who, who sits here more? I'm doing it because it's what I do, and I'm just, yeah, it's be proud. You can put those hands up. It's okay, right? Love is a choice. Okay, who, who's more over here where you're like, oh, God, my faith, I'm just moved by, oh, who's there? Hands up? Okay, now, who's here then? <laughs> ah, good, good. Um, I think we're meant to be all three, honestly, because <laughs> life is ebbs and flows, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, God's given us a great illustration with marriage. Um, and whether you're in a marriage right now or not, we can see marriage for what it is, right? And there's so many movies that mock <laughs> marriage, really, and the journey, the ebbs and flows of marriage, um, because, you know, there are times of, I love and then there are times where I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to choose to go home tonight. <laughs> right? And then there are times in the middle where you're like, yeah, no, I'm going to choose. Right? And so we have this great example in, our marriage, in, in marriages to see, um, honestly, that's faith. You know? Um, so I think if we were to put it within our own bodies, just as an illustration, I think sometimes our faith lives here in our heart. I think sometimes our faith lives here in our minds, right? I think sometimes we are intellectually pursuing God and we're choosing it. Josh and I, before we were married, um, we have kind of a weird uh, story. Some of you know it uh, because we didn't date before we got engaged and I wasn't pregnant or anything like that. <laughs> um, even though some people in our college group thought that why else would you get married so fast? But we actually both had a word from the Lord that we were supposed to get married. I don't actually recommend that route. It's, <laughs> it's awkward, isn't it, babe? Yeah. So, um, uh, but right from the start, we felt God tell us, you're going to have to choose to love each other. And so we didn't actually start out here. Most relationships do, right? Oh, he's so handsome. And, 
whatever, what the men say, she's amazing. Well, I don't know what men say. What? <laughs> oh, hot. Okay. Yes, that would be what men say. You're right. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> anyway, um, Anna is a, a surprising story tucked in Luke. Um, whenever I, I come across stories like this, it, it, to me, it begs the ask of why is this story in the Bible? Because it doesn't actually, um, uh, script writers, any script writers in here? Any, any movie, movie enthousi- enthusiasts, cr- critics? Okay. You know there's an editor's cut of a movie, right? And then there's like the theatrical release or the director's cut. I said editor's cut, director's cut. Um, and then there's like deleted scenes. And then there's like scenes that are on the cutting room floor even more. And then there's scenes that were in the script that never even got looked at. Okay? Um, if it doesn't advance a story, it's not worth screen time, basically. <coughs> right, Adam? Our director. Correct me if I'm wrong. But there, I'm correct, yes. Th- there are, you know, there are just things that if... if um, you know, if your hero needs to get to a certain place and he takes the scenic route to get there, you're like, <laughs> why? Why didn't he go straight to the burning building? Why did he have donuts first? It doesn't make any sense. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's things about that. I look at Anna's life and I say, or Anna's story, and I'm like, well, what are we doing over here with Anna? It doesn't, we were about Jesus, we were about Mary and Joseph, right? And a prophetic word from the Lord. And then, after Anna's story, it talks about some more Jesus stuff. And there's this, like, donut run <laughs> in Luke. Okay. I make this stuff up on the spot. I just want you to know <laughs> that was not in the plan at all. Now I'm craving donuts. <laughs> Gluten-free, sugar-free. I have a terrible diet. It's awful. It's not a donut, you're right. (laughs) Josh and I like to talk about, um, oh, what am I doing? (laughs) I totally messed it up, guys. Can you fix it for me? Oh, I'm running, I'm, no, 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 I had it right. When people ask me to help them with their tech stuff, I say, no, Josh is, I'm the pretty one, he is the (laughs) technical, (laughs) he's actually also the pretty one, it's unfortunate. All right. (laughs) <laughs> he is hot. Okay, Luke 2, 36 to 38. Now, we're going to lean in and look for some speed bumps together, okay, like we did last week. So, you ready? Okay. Anna the prophetess was also there, creeper stalker in the corner, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel of tribe of Asher, and she was very old. It, we did not typecast the role today, so... Um, but she was very old. She'd been married seven years and a widow for 84. She never left the temple enclosure, but was worshiping night and day with fasting and prayer. She came along at the very time Simeon was praying. She broke into an anthem of praise to God and talked about the child to all who were waiting expectantly for the promised king to come and deliver Jerusalem. It doesn't advance our story much, does it? It doesn't tell us much about the next thing for Jesus. And so I'm asking, why, God? What is this about Anna? So I prayed. Um, You know, we talked about how Kurt's leaning in for prophetic teaching each week for our congregation, and we want to ask God, what are you saying to us today from your word that transcends time? Right? So I prayed, and this is what I felt God say to me. I loved Anna. And that's why her story is in Luke. And my immediate response back to God, I don't know why I think it's okay to be so uh, rude. (laughs) But I said, you loved her? Widowed after seven years? Yeah, something, something off there in my heart. Do you feel that? Okay, you loved her. Here's what I know about widows in that time. Um, 
They could have been married again. She was not, according to this passage. She would have lived with family, but she does not. So that makes me think that she had no family. And she's living in the temple, not because, I want to live in the temple, yay, I love God. But maybe I literally have no other place to go. Intellectual moment (laughs) in a very emotional time in her life. Also, I see no mention of children in this passage. So I'm guessing she also was childless. And after seven years of marriage, that makes me wonder if there were infertility issues. I don't know. We will meet Anna one day. That'll be exciting, won't it? Don't call her creeper stalker to her face. (laughs) Oh man, I'm going to have to apologize to her. Okay. Uh, But you know, I think Anna, widowed, no family, alone, no children. You loved her, God? Yeah. Well, here's how I know that there was something going on in Anna's life. There's two speed bumps that really, like, jumped out at me. So let me, let me know what you think about this first one. She never left the temple enclosure, worshipping night and day with fasting and prayer. Woo! <laughs> that's funny, yeah. Jenny, I would expect you to be like, yeah, go girl. There's a part of me that's like, you are too much, Anna. <laughs> I hope your story is not in the Bible because I have to live that way. Because I am tired. <laughs> I want sleep. Night and day, fasting and prayer. There is something in Anna's life. Old in years, living in the temple from a long time. There's, there's a sense there that soon after she was widowed, she moved to the temple, right? There's just this sense, right, that she'd been there a long time. Who has been walking with the Lord a long time? Put your hands up. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi. A long time. Who still has that original passion that makes you want to, like, fast and pray night and day? Oh, I don't know why I came back over here. (laughs) Stay here. I'm inspired by this moment with Anna because, you know what it speaks to me, honestly? You cannot live that life out of uh, religious requirement. You can't stay awake all night (laughs) and fast and pray. The disciples couldn't even do it. You can't do that without some special motivation. Wouldn't you say? This donut run is pretty cool. I'm getting inspired by Anna's life. There's something about her that's really special. um, (laughs) I also want to say this. I admire her. I don't really relate to her. I would like to be like her, except I don't want to have to lose everything and move into the temple to get there. And I think it's great that she can do this day and night. Um, This morning, I was dressing and feeding and uh, hairdressing children (laughs) before I came to the temple. (laughs) She never had to do that, so it's kind of nice that she gets to fast and pray all the time, but nice for her. She doesn't have to do dishes or go to the grocery store. She just stays in the temple all the time. Lady of leisure. Okay. A little. Second speed bump, she broke into an anthem of praise to God and talked about the child. Whoa, man, here's what happened. She's over. She just happens to come by. She's in the women's court. We talked about that last week in ex- exterior court, uh, courtyard of the temple. She just happens to see this thing unfold. And her response, an explosion of worship just explosion and then couldn't stop talking about it like immediately one of the translations says and immediately this is just response that's pretty cool man god loved anna guess what anna loved god um This is 
actually... <laughs> I'm reading between the lines. I'm not sure that this is what God's word is saying, but this is what I saw. Can I share it with you? Okay. God had a baby. And he brought it, brought him to show Anna. Um, before our daughter was born, it's actually her fifth birthday today. In addition to prepping a sermon this week, I was planning a five-year-old princess party. <laughs> Anna never had to do that. Um, <laughs> um, but so five years ago today, she was born um, by kind of an emergency C-section situation. Um, they had some concerns about her. She had a regular, irregular heartbeat. That means every fifth beat was bad. So the head of cardiology at Children's was watching her. And um, those who are closest to me, you all remember, that was a very hard month, that last month of her, I was going to say life, in utero life <laughs> is what I meant. Um, and we did not know. We also found out during that time there was some size problems. They were worried about the length of her limbs and her size in general. She'd stop growing. I didn't know what was going on, and I cried a lot, a lot and a lot, because we didn't know how this baby would turn out. And the day of this C-section kind of happened real fast. We are like, let's get her out so we can start treating her as her own patient, right? It's hard to treat a inside a womb, inside a little body, there's a heart that needs help, right? It was, so they're like, let's just get her out. So she came out early. That, uh, my hospital room was packed. The hallways was packed. <laughs> there w I had an entourage, like this major entourage. There's a, um, a dear friend of mine, Mary Shelton, is a NICU nurse at the hospital. She was not on shift that day, but she came <laughs> to be there because she knew she would be going to the NICU. And she did. As soon as um, she was born, went straight to the NICU, and I didn't meet her for two hours as they tried to make sure that everything was okay. Guess what? Everything was okay. Um, and I don't know why sometimes God takes you through those times, right? <laughs> um, and even if everything had not been okay, God had spoken to me about he needs missionaries in every people group. And so if she had been special needs, that would be her, her calling, right? So I had hope, even though I had grief. Anyway, uh, as they carried her up to the NICU, I, I was on the table, so I only know this by hearsay. People were like, ah, wanting to meet her, because they have to go through the hallway to get up to the NICU. And, um, and I remember later that day when she was in the room with us, I specifically remember Wanda coming. Wanda, where are you? Wave to me. I specifically remember Wanda coming and holding her for a long time. And actually, a lot of my dearest friends came and held her for a long time, but I remember Wanda like looking at her little fingers and like, Really, if I felt like she was studying her, and because she was Wanda's baby too. Because I'd been working with Wanda, and I'd shared a lot with her, and she had carried this baby in her heart. And so she was holding her like it was her baby too. This Anna moment feels to me like that. For 60 plus years, arguably, she had been praying for God's redemption plan. She had been carrying his plan in her heart. And I feel like God brought his son to the temple to say, Anna, your baby's been born too. Your savior, the king you've been waiting for. Wow. Is that cool? It's beautiful. And I look at this, um, Anna, widowed, alone, living in a temple, not someone that we would look at and say, blessed. And yet she was intertwined with God on like a romantic level almost. Do you know what I mean? Like this, they had a special, special relationship. I would like that. Again, can I be clear? I don't want to lose everything <laughs> to get there. And can we be confident of this? The stories of the way God moves through people's lives. We don't all have to cookie cutter our lives to be like Anna to experience God's intimacy, right? So I hold on to that hope. <laughs> and this is the joy that we have with our faith with the God that we know. Each of our lives is unique and he's, he has us on a journey that's just for us. 
And so none of us, none of us will have a life like Anna. Um, some of us may want, may want a life like Anna. You know, some of us are widows. And it would be nice not to have to work so hard and, and try and pay the bills. And but the thing that just really pulled at my heart is God loved Anna. And Anna loved God. And in that moment, Anna's response was a passionate outpouring of worship and honestly, evangelism. <laughs> Couldn't stop talking about Jesus. And that is a place I want to be. Um, a few years ago, we were in Mexico uh, taking our youth on a mission trip. Becca was with me. We were at the Mazatlan Airport heading back to Seattle. We'd been there for, I guess our trip was two weeks in total. And there was um, a camera crew and a lot of hubbub happening, and the kids were all over. I don't know why I was not with them. Prop sanity break or something. <laughs> But I was standing off to the side, and, and I s happened to stand next to a guy in a suit. And um, he, I said to him, who, who is that? He's like, you don't know who that is? And I was like, oh, don't be offensive. Whew. I am so sorry. I'm from Australia, but now I live in America. And I apologize. I don't know much about Mexico, but I'd like to learn. Who is that? Well, he was like a uh, politician, high-ranking politician, um, at the time, I remember the elections were going on and Fox was, I think Fox was elected again or first time or something like that, but he was like maybe second down or something from Fox or something. He was a big deal. I was like, oh. He came over and talked to me through his assistant who was like a bouncer and then translator. <laughs> um, what are you here for? Who are you and why are you here and who are all these kids and what's going on? Whoa, amazing opportunity, right? Preach the gospel. Here we go. We, we did dental work. <laughs> That's what I said. Now, we had done dental work one of the days. Uh, all of a sudden, this fear gripped me. I remembered this story when I was thinking about Anna, and I was like, uh, I was tired, that's for sure, because two weeks with that many junior hires is a push. And, um, you know, we were hot, and uh, I don't know, like in that moment, it was not a <sighs> outpouring. It was a quick, think of something to say. <laughs> like I was in a persecuted area and I would g get killed for saying Jesus. Like that's how my response was. <laughs> Weird. Uh, it actually happened last Sunday again. After church, I went to Trader Joe's to get groceries for the week. And um, they have great gluten-free stuff. Just putting that out there. Um, and it's, it's the cheapest, so tuck that away. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, my checker said, how was your weekend? It was so much, it was so sunny. What did you do in the sunshine this weekend? I, I, I was prepping a sermon, so I like prayed and wrote. That's what I said to him. <laughs> oh man, I want this. I want this outpouring. You know, I wanted to say, oh my gosh, I had the best weekend. You know, I, Simeon, I don't know. I wish the Holy Spirit had like, like that would have been great. I don't, I want to be more like Anna. I want that. Do you feel that pull on your heart? Anna's story calling to you? Mm. So, uh, <laughs> what does this verse do to you? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Let me do another translation for you. The proof that we love God comes when we keep his commandments. What does that do to you? Is that this? Oh, or is this, is it this? Keep his commandments. I think our natural response is, oh, oh, okay, if I do the things I need to do, then it's proof that I love God. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I have some deeds. My I, I should have some deeds, commandments, follow God's commandments. I, I, has anyone else had this response when you see the word commandments? I, I'm always like, but, but which ones? <laughs> There's so many. Are you referring to the whole of Deuteronomy or just portions of it at this point? Keep, like, which commandments? Because I thought we weren't keeping commandments anymore. Or we, is this just the love God, love others one? Or is this also the, like, adultery and murder one, too? Do you know what I mean? Like, have you ever, is that just me? 
please, please, somebody else. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but there is a lot packed into this verse. Keep his commandments. That's how you show your love for God. Except for that little, those little words at the end. But his commandments are not bothersome. They're not troublesome. Do you know what that speaks of to me, to my heart? Love, outpouring, produces the deeds that are God's command. And it's this love that is evidence that we are God's children. And they're not burdensome. And they're not troublesome. Because it's this outflowing. Isn't that what that verse is saying? And yet, I come over here so often. Because <laughs> oh, life is busy, and I'm tired. We had children later in life because we gave the first decade of our marriage to investing in the youth group, and we knew we were called to that. But man, 40 and having children, like small children, is tough. Anyone else? Is, I know there's more of us out there. <laughs> <So> <laughs> And there are times when I just want to be moved, like I just want to have that passion of Anna, and honestly what I need is a nap. <laughs> yeah. But I am pulled to this. In, um, in marriage, um, in, in marriage, we are to work on our marriage. Do you know what I mean? Marriage just isn't like a thing, and once you like, paid your money for your license, you're good. <laughs> like that, <laughs> it's a funny story. I find it funny. It may not be funny to everyone. But the husband, you know, the wife, they're in counseling, husband and wife, and the wife's like, he just doesn't say that he loves me anymore. And he's like, I, I said it the day we got married. If anything had changed, I would have told you. <laughs> right? Well, that's not a marriage of this, is it? It's not like, oh, ha, ha. <laughs> I already told you I married you, I, or that I loved you. If anything would change, it's just funny, isn't it? Not unless it's been said to you, then it's not funny. <laughs> but marriage takes work. Love takes work, right? Love is something you have to invest in. And I think sometimes when I'm sitting over here in my, my walk with God, um, there are some things I can do, not deeds to prove my love for God, but things that can stir up my love, stir up my passion, uh, you've, you've lost that loving feeling, the song. <laughs> There's words in it. He says, we've got something so special. Don't let it slip away. Baby, baby. Okay. Maybe we might have to sing this at the end of the service today all together. Um, but there's something about don't let it slip away, right? I mean, we have not out of religious requirement, but because I want to have a love like Anna had with God. You know, I want this marriage, not this marriage. Now, love is a choice every day. Josh and I are committed to choosing to love each other. But at the same time, it's really nice when you actually feel like you love each other too. Those are good days, <laughs> aren't they? So there are things that you can do to stir up your love in your marriage life. Uh, romantic getaway. Uh, well, in your faith, that might look like a retreat or a conference, some time away with God. Um, in a marriage, you might go have date nights. Schedule a regular date night. The people that say that, I would like them to come and offer free sitting for Josh and I. That's what I would like. <laughs> Schedule a regular date night. Okay. Um, but maybe your regular date night is find a place where you feel close to God and weekly put it on your calendar. It's date night with God. I'm being super, like, specific and practical. Here's the thing. It's going to be unique for each of us. For Anna, it meant living in the temple, day and night fasting. Um, sometimes we're going to have seasons of that. Uh, one of the things that makes me love Josh more than this... <laughs> One of the things that moves me to this place with Josh is watching him. Um, this is going to be really weird. Sorry, honey. Anyone here think Josh is really amazing? <laughs> Who is like... <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> if, if you've ever seen him in action and have been like, wow, Josh is amazing, just put your hand up for a sec. Oh, I wish you could see the love. Don't turn around, it's really embarrassing. Um, <laughs> But there's something about Josh when he is, like, he's um, very gifted. He's intellectual, he's emotional, and he's very um, gifted technically as well. And when those three things collide into a situation, he pretty much can fix anything. He can fix the issue, he can calm Kurt down, or anyone, <laughs> anyone that's upset. <laughs> there's something about Josh when he, I mean, uh, last night he was cooking some meat, and I'm, I'm not very a good cook at all. And I just was like, you are so gifted at that. And he just looked at me like, he doesn't even understand. He's so gifted. Everything he touches gets better. It's amazing. It's amazing. But, you know, life can get so busy, and the children can be so, like, in our faces that I'm not even aware of what he's doing. You know what I mean? It's like, well, I know what he's not doing. He didn't take the trash, and he didn't... <laughs> not picking up his socks and whatever, right? Because in that, in that place, I can just forget to watch him. But when I watch him and watch how gifted he is and how loving he is and how he changes things for the better, my heart turns towards him. That is so the same with me and God. I mean, that's the thing that really moves me the most when it comes to God, when I watch him act, when I see him in action. Um, that's what I love about this Empowered series, because when you're stepping out and the Holy Spirit is ministering through you, you get to see God's, um, God in action. And man, that stirs my heart for God. Um, the other thing that um, stirs my heart for love with Josh is when we go on adventures together. People thought we were crazy taking the youth group all around the world to do ministry. Those were the best weeks of our lives, right, babe? I mean, we were in separate buildings. We barely even saw each other for two weeks. But seeing each other in action, watching Josh in that adventurous setting, like overcoming great odds and a lot of puke of children. In <laughs> there was a lot. <laughs> Mexico for two weeks with lots of junior hires. It's or Thailand with Will. Same, same. <laughs> um, but, you know, watching him care for people in those times and those adventures, you know, stirs my heart. Funnily enough, the same thing. Missions stirs my heart for God. Like when I see him working through people groups and, and, and I see him in the same action that I see him here in our lives, I see him acting the same thing out all around the world. And you're like, whoa, God is big. Oh, God is real. He is moving. He is alive. I got so distracted by everything. I forgot how beautiful and amazing God is. So I wanted to share um, a clip with you of um, God in action and in a missionary setting, actually, um, to stir your hearts towards love today. If you are here most of the time in your faith, ask God to show you how to inch your way back, invest in your love with him so things can be an outpouring again. If you are here and you, you have this outpouring, I want to encourage you to engage the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in a place where when you are asking God, looking and leaning, ready to minister for him, that it is an outpouring, that you really let your love be the thing that motivates you. Because uh, we can all be inspired by Anna in this. I want, when I see Jesus, I want this to happen. Yeah. What do you think? Okay, I'm going to run this clip, and then Kurt's going to come up. Um, and so, settle back. It's 10 minutes. Um, it's actually, the entire clip is 23, and I edited it down. Um, if you want to see the full version, um, that you can jot down the name of the clip. It'll come up right at the beginning. It's online everywhere. Um, it's called Etau. And it's about a tribe in Papua New Guinea. It was filmed 20 plus years ago. And the awesome news about this tribe is that um, uh, their effect on their community now, it's ongoing. So what you see happen at the beginning here is still in action today, 20 plus years later. So God is moving. It's exciting. So um, let, your, let your love be stirred up, your love for God, as we watch this clip. Sound good? Okay. We're going to dim some lights too, I think, guys. Should we dim the house lights a bit?
you move into a tribe, those things you learn first are the most obvious. Where they live, what they eat, and how they prepare it. What is not so obvious is how they view life, what they believe. As we studied their way of life and how they thought, one of the things that stood out was the constant fear and deception the people lived in. One area involved their dead ancestors. The men would dress up in a large mass and dance around the village. They believed that this was the spirit of a dead ancestor returned. The men told us that the women did not know that it was them who wore the mask. They kept the mask hid in a special place reserved only for men. They explained to us that if a woman ever saw the mask by itself, or if she let on she knew about the mask, and that it was only a man who wore it and not a spirit, for that woman, the penalty was death. When I was a little boy, my mother saw the mask by itself. Her two brothers took her to the woods. They did not want to, but they had to. Our beliefs demanded it. They put a bark rope around her neck. I was very young, but I remember it well. My mother was young. I loved her. Well, a day does come, though, when you do know enough of their language and how they think to explain to them the Word of God. Now the question is this, where do you start? The Bible is a big book, and none of these Mok tribal people had any previous exposure to God's Word. Before we could start teaching, we had to prepare Bible lessons. Even before we started to teach, the Mok seemed to sense a wonderful message was coming. When the teaching finally started, the entire village of 310 people gathered. We began by showing them a map of their village. Then we showed them where the surrounding Mok villages were located on that map. We explained to them progressively where they were located in relationship to the neighboring tribal groups, where in the province they were located, and where Papua New Guinea was in relationship to Australia, Japan, United States, and Israel. Then we explained how the Bible, God's talk, many years ago had come from Israel to Europe and then around the world and was now coming to them, the Mok people. In the second lesson, we discussed how different people groups believed they arrived here on this earth. The Mok people believed they were created by two different birds. When we told them that some people in our country believe they evolved from an ape-like creature, they said, they're stupid. We asked them, out of all of these beliefs, which one is correct? And they said, we don't know. Then we told them, this is why God has given his written word to mankind and it never changes. Starting with God, we explained what he is like, his attributes. Then we told them about Satan and his fallen angels. The Mok felt that hell is a fitting place for Satan and that God was right in preparing it for him and his demons. From there we taught them about creation and Adam and Eve and man's choice to sin. We explained how God promised a Savior who would someday come to deliver us from sin. Other Old Testament stories followed in which we emphasize God's greatness and grace, man's lostness in sin and helpless condition, and God's provision of a blood sacrifice through the killing of a lamb. Often we use drama to help them understand what we were teaching. When we told how God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, it presented a dilemma. Abraham was obviously a godly man, so he would obey God. But it was through Isaac that the Savior of the world was promised to come. Before we finish the story, four different men individually suggested that Abraham would obey God, but God would somehow intervene and save Isaac's life by providing a substitute lamb. They developed a sincere reverence of God and feared daily that God might rightly destroy them because of their sin. They said, 
We are just like those people in Sodom and Gomorrah. For two months, we taught key Old Testament stories chronologically before we finally introduced Jesus Christ as the Savior born as a babe in this world. As we studied the life of Christ, they fell in love with him and Jesus became the Mok hero. They loved him and they idolized him. Never during the weeks Mark taught did a villager miss a lesson, though he taught for three months, Monday through Friday, two times a day. Villagers that were sick were brought on makeshift stretchers. And when an expectant mother was near delivery, they arranged for her to be close enough to the meeting to hear the story. At times, the moke were so intense, they stopped eating and would not even sleep. They spent every waking moment discussing the message and re-listening over and over again to the lessons recorded on cassette tapes. This wonderful Jesus was perfect, and he could do anything. He was God. The day finally came to explain the betrayal by Judas and the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Judas's betrayal was upsetting to the most, but they still had faith that somehow Jesus would escape. That was the last story we told them before the gospel presentation. At the end of it, we said, tomorrow we will finish our talk. The next morning, the people were all gathered before sunrise. I told the story of Jesus appearing before Pilate. The people were very sober. When during our skit they saw Jesus being spit upon, beaten, and finally put to death, they were simply appalled. They were distraught. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Our explanation and portrayal of Jesus Christ's resurrection was simple, but to them, very powerful. The Savior was alive. I said to them, listen, just as a real lamb was substituted for Isaac, so Christ's death and blood has been shed as a substitution for you. At that point, the lights really went on. I could see and hear them responding all over the crowd. I believe, I believe, I believe. I stood in their midst and asked them what they thought. From all over, responses came like this. I know I was born in sin. I believe Jesus paid for my sin, that he died in my place. He is my sin bearer. I lived in fear trying to please the spirits for I knew no other way to be free from sin. I've heard it and believe the death and blood of Christ is payment for my sin. On that day, almost all the village expressed belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a sense of tremendous relief. The Mok are generally a restrained people, but as the gospel sunk in and new believers sensed the liberation from sin, spontaneous rejoicing broke out. Watch what happened. <laughs> Village believers stating that he too believes that Christ has paid for his sins. Itao, which means it's true or it's good, it's very true. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer. Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itao, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours.
Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, we reach down and we take this cup that is in front of us. And just using precisely the imagery that Justine has painted for us by your leading of being on the one side where it is about works and where it is about effort and where it is about doing things. And then we understand that there is that aspect. But, but contrasting that with the place where the things that we do are things that arise spontaneously. They are the expressions and the manifestations of love. We come before you as believers who have begun in the spirit, begun in that place of overflowing love, and have somehow found ourselves slipping to that other place, and that that is a breaking of our lives. That's what this bread in the lower cup is about. So we take our finger and we stick it in there and we I love that sound. We just have broken our lives by forgetting what we started with, by forgetting what this is really about, by forgetting that the doing the things that you've asked us to do are the easiest things in the world when we're in love and the hardest things to do when we're not. And so we're asking you in that illustration of marriage that you would begin to show us how it is that we are restore our love for one another as spouses, as friends. We go through periods of time that are going from that love place to another. And yet, God, by your leading, you will restore us unto the joy of our salvation. And so in Jesus' holy and precious name with that powerful image, of a village that has been touched and is responding in love. We want to respond in love right now. We want to take this body and raise it up to you, the one, the life, with an understanding it's the life that we have broken. And we want to say in Jesus' holy and precious name, God. In Jesus' holy and precious name. By the way, as we've got this cup held up, if you're here and you don't know the Lord, what what a more beautiful and perfect time to say yes and amen to him. And you can raise your hand to me if you want. Other people have their hands. Other people have their eyes closed and so on. But I just am saying, just, just between you and the Lord, would you just call out and ask him to eat how it's true, to, to, to let him come to your heart and show you the degree to which this is true. Because that's how you're going to get it going to show you that this is true. So I ask him to come and to show you. Speak. And so in Jesus' holy and precious name, we lift this cup, all of us, recognizing the degree to which we have sinned. We have broken our fellowship. We have broken our lives. And now we take this cup together, knowing that Jesus Christ is the one who took upon himself all that brokenness in order to make us whole. That's why we take this, to be made whole. Take together, would you please? And now in Jesus' beautiful name, we understand that that life is in the blood and that blood shed was him pouring out his life that we might live. And that when he did that on the cross, that everything that we ever needed for every one of our lives, every single bit of it, was already done. And so we lift this cup in remembrance that it has been done. And that all we need to do is enter in. And you've given us that powerful way to enter in, which is through the gates of love and not works. And so God, understanding that you have given us everything already in fullness, we come before you and we ask you, let this life of love become our hallmark, become our beacon, become the way in which we interface with you more and more and more. Take this cup that that life should become yours. taking just one more second. 
we had Justine preach twice in a row, I actually had someone comment, you know, our pastor doesn't preach that much anymore. I think we've gotten some awfully good preaching. And I'm so happy about where it's coming from. I'm telling it at my age and where I'm at right now. I get more joy out of that than anything I could speak. I just think that was remarkable. And I'm not trying to give you any honor or glory. We do want to thank you for the effort and the hard work and the seeking God on our behalf. But we recognize that you're just one of many people that God has laid on their hearts to become e to become the blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. And that's your feet. We want to recognize this and we want to just lift it up and we want to thank God in this moment for what he's doing in this congregation to take us from that passive church thing where people are actually dying to this incredible family where people are invested with their lives and growing in love. And now in Jesus' holy and precious name as we take this offering, God, we don't give it because it's a work. We give it because it's a pleasure. We give it because our love overflows. We give it because we are drawn to the way that you have ordained that life should live instead of the way that we've been living it. And that we recognize that this is one of those key areas in which when we, when we respond in obedience, that what actually, is, what actually we're purchasing is that presence, that love. It's not to earn it. It's just, I didn't say that right. But there's something about as we respond, even if we're in that other place, as we respond and we get it right, not out of works, but going towards what you have poured out to us, which is so infinitely more, and that you want to bless us with yet more. And so we get ourselves into that motion, into that whirlwind, that you might take us up to heaven where we can see you yet again, yet afresh, and fall in love with you infinitely more. So in Jesus' holy and precious name, receive this offering from us in love, not compulsion and not works and not earning. But because we say to you, we know how much more there is. We love you and we pour out our love in a tangible fashion, knowing that you pour back into us in ever greater measure. So in Jesus' holy and precious name, receive this offering in that heart, in that spirit. Thank you, God. And as the baskets come around, be sure and put your survey in there too, okay? Nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare.